Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Ferox and today let's talk about allergies and anaphylaxis, which are hypersensitivity type 1 reactions. A type 1 hypersensitivity is a perfectly normal and appropriate response to parasites. To anything else, it's an allergy, which is an inappropriate response to something fairly harmless. Allergies are probably the most common conditions I get to see in small animal practice. A type 1 hypersensitivity reaction results in both acute and chronic inflammation, but all of it is related to IgE, produced by the highly specific adaptive response to an antigen. If you haven't watched the Immunology Basics video already, now would be a good time, because you need to remember mast cells, antibody production and IgE in particular. Are you ready? On we go. Mast cells are big buggers that are found all over the body near blood vessels, including in the spleen, gut, lungs, and most importantly in dogs and cats, the skin. The exact numbers in each location vary between species and individuals, but it is the reason different species present with allergies in different ways. For example, dogs usually don't get watery eyes and a runny nose, they usually itch, even to a food allergen. These big cells are absolutely full of very distinctive granules, which is why they're relatively easy to identify under the microscope, even in a general practice, and those granules contain lots of active components, including histamine, the most well-known, and the reason that you, as a human, will take an antihistamine when you're having an allergy, but they also contain a number of other proteins, including proteases, which digest protein, and cell signaling molecules, like cytokines and leukotrienes, which attract additional immune system cells to the site of inflammation and cause a whole lot of tissue damage. Now this tissue damage which is also helped in a large part by eosinophils, another key player. It's actually a useful and adaptive response to treat parasites, because it hurts the parasites, but it also will hurt both normal tissue, which is why an allergy is a problem, and tumour tissue, if you happen to have one. So how do mast cells activate? Remember those B cells that produce highly specific antibodies in response to an antigen? Those antibodies only bind to their target antigen, and while some are free-floating or secreted in milk and tears, IgE is picked up by mast cells and sits on its surface, waiting patiently for the right antigen to come along so that it can bind to it and activate the mast cell. Now, a mast cell might have lots of different IgE molecules on its surface, depending on what that animal's immune system has already experienced. The IgE on the surface of a mast cell needs to bind to its antigen in order to activate the cell. And specifically, it needs cross-linking, where more than one of those antibodies have bound to the allergen in order to stimulate the response. There are some other things which can also activate mast cells. Some toxins will activate them. So will some drugs, if you're particularly unlucky. Uh, different inflammatory proteins and even physical trauma. So crushing a mast cell will cause it to activate and release all those granules and stimulate an immune response. Cancerous mast cells are particularly prone to activating if you poke them too hard. But while these reactions are severe, they're not anaphylactic because they're not using IgE. They're actually anaphylactoid because they look an awful lot like it, but the IgE isn't involved at all. So what do these notorious mast cells do when they activate, releasing their granules and beginning the manufacture of other late stage components? In the acute phase, most of the proteins are vasoactive. This means that the protein has an effect on blood vessels. In particular, they increase blood vessel permeability to make them leaky and smooth muscle contraction, 
which results in red and swollen tissue. You're probably very familiar with that. In the late stage, the cytokines and other chemotactic agents attract more inflammatory cells and instigates the tissue damage. All of this happens over minutes to hours in the acute phase, but can take days to months in the chronic phase. This is why it takes so long to get skin symptoms under control with allergic disease. And it's why food allergy symptoms can take months to disappear. Genetic factors are thought to play a significant factor in whether an individual develops an allergy or not. Genetics can develop how much of which cells in various locations an individual has, how many chemotactic factors they produce, their IgE to IgG ratio, and so on and so forth. The predisposition for allergens often runs in families, but genetics don't predict which allergen an individual will develop a reaction to, just that they are prone to allergies in general. An animal prone to multiple allergies is often said to have atopy. If you have an allergic reaction affecting the whole body, that is, it's systemic, we call this anaphylaxis. Well-known allergies that can result in anaphylaxis include things like the notorious peanuts and seafood, but can also include things like blood transfusions, insect venom, various drugs, and even vaccines, though this is particularly rare. Fascinatingly, it also happens with mammalian meat allergy, which is yet another thing in Australia, just waiting to kill you, but more on that later. Anaphylaxis is acute. It happens suddenly and systemic, meaning it affects everything. There is multi-organ shock and it can result in death. Most of the acute phase inflammatory mediators are targeting blood vessels and their smooth muscle. And this results in itch, redness, and swelling. The fluid in the swelling has to come from somewhere elsewhere in the body. And so we get hypotension because the fluid is pulled out of your blood vessels. And then to compensate for that, we get a high heart rate. Effects on the smooth muscle will cause bronchospasm, which is a narrowing of the airways. And the swelling can also happen in the larynx. causing laryngeal edema. Excuse the cats having lots of fun in the background. One or both of these will result in difficulty breathing. Which is already a pretty bad thing. And then you get hypoxia because you're not getting enough oxygen and because you're hypertensive, you can't carry that oxygen around well enough. And this will result in unconsciousness or death. Simply because you don't have enough blood pressure to carry your oxygen and you're not breathing well enough in the first place. Most anaphylactic reactions are to something injected, like a drug or insect venom, in all but the most sensitive individuals, which brings us to the fascinating mammalian meat allergy. If you are bitten by a tick in Australia, and we have plenty of the buggers down our east coast, which is where most of our population is, you may develop 
a life-threatening allergy to mammalian meat and its associated products. This is because ticks feed by injecting their mouthparts into their host for a feed and inject saliva and anticoagulants. They're frequently contaminated by previous meals and inject a little of that foreign protein as well. Now you might think that's not that bad. Surely we humans are made from mammalian meat. So how can we become allergic to something that we're made of? Well, it turns out the mammalian meat allergy is an allergy to alpha galactose or alpha gal for short, which is a carbohydrate found on the cell surface of most mammals, except for old world monkeys great apes and humans. Thanks evolution. So someone with an alpha gal allergy could potentially eat a gorilla quite safely, but not any of our domestic or commonly eaten species. And some can't even eat gelatin, dairy, or anything with a taurine supplement without risking anaphylaxis and death. It can also take several hours after the meal to manifest. And most people have eaten meat perfectly fine before they suddenly became allergic because of this tick bite. So as you can imagine, it's not a pleasant surprise. A localized hypersensitivity type one is much more common and it's just one tissue or organ that's affected. Most common in dogs and cats is the skin but it can also be things like the airways and the gut. It doesn't actually matter how the animal is contacting the allergen, whether it's by touch, whether it's inhaled or whether it's eaten. In dogs and cats, most of our symptoms still show up in the skin. This is important to note that even a food allergy most commonly presents with skin disease. And because of late phase inflammation, it can persist for days or months. So food trials to diagnose food allergy need to be conducted over a long period of time. I hope that makes sense. Are you confused yet? That's allergies for you. The immune system is sensitized to an antigen and it produces immunoglobulins that are specific for that antigen which attach to the mast cells, which go nuts anytime that antigen shows up. The immune system is primed for these antigens the same way we can train it with a vaccine. So if you're not sure, it's worth watching the previous immunology video again, just to clarify. But that's enough for now. Hopefully I'll have an immune mediated hemolytic anemia video coming soon as a different type of hypersensitivity reaction. But for now, my name is Dr. Ferox and I'll see you next time. And if you were wondering, this is what those naughty cats were fighting over in the background. Weren't you, buddy? You don't care about allergies at all, do you? <laughs>